Uh, if you'll keep your Bible, Bibles open to Hebrews, my message this morning comes from Hebrews 6, and uh, there's two verses uh, I'm going to be using, verses 17 through 19, a couple verses. And if you take notes, I've anchored the me I've uh, I've anchored the message. I've entitled the message "Anchored in Sovereignty." Anchored in Sovereignty, Hebrews six seventeen through nineteen. Thus saith the Lord: Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutable immutability of His counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong encouragement who have fled for res refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil. Before we look at that text, let's ask the Holy Spirit to open it up to our, our hearts and minds. Spirit of God, we come to you in thanksgiving for this wonderful text. And we ask you to walk amongst us. And again, if there's one here or online listening who knows not Christ as Savior, we pray, God, that today would be the day that they would meet Jesus Christ, their Savior. And we ask you, Lord, to also walk amongst us and those who need comfort, those who need edification, or even those who need conviction. Whatever we need, Lord, from this message, your, your word says it never comes back void. So as you speak it directly to your people, give us the, the ears to hear and the hearts to live. Anything we, we hear here, Lord, that we can apply to our lives. Give us the applications we need to be better disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Anchored in sovereignty. Text is one of many, many uh, passages in the Bible that talk about um, or that teach that God, and here it comes again, does not want his people to be anxious for nothing. There's no reason for a child of God to be anxious for nothing. And last week I said to you that, that the words fear not, I looked it up, 365 times in the Bible. Think about that. Why would he do that? He doesn't want his children to be anxious about anything. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I said before our prayer, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your request known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ. Simply put, it's a sin to be anxious, not concerned, but to be anxious. Why? Because he's he tells us in so many places, in so many places, there's no need for it. He's in charge, and he's especially in charge of our lives. He wants all of those who claim Christ as their Savior, to be encouraged. He wants us to be uh, uh, reassured that his promises are unchangeable and they're irrevocable. You know, when you were a kid, your mom, could, you did, your mom said, you know, Tuesday, I'm going to take you somewhere, but you better be good. If you're not good, we ain't going. Well, before Tuesday came, something happened, of course, and you're not good. So what did mommy do? My mommy, we didn't go. And I, maybe that's not too popular today, but back in the day, it was very popular. And what that did was it showed me that I have to behave myself. And if I don't, there's something that there's a penalty for it. What God does is never take anything back. Never. No matter how bad I am, no matter how much I sin, God will never, never be uh uh, change any of the promises he's given me, especially the one about chastisement. <laughs> he'll he'll enforce that problem if it's necessary. Now, how does he do this? He does it by lowering himself. It says that he gave an oath uh, that his promises would never fail. He lowered himself 
so that we would understand that he made an oath and he couldn't make it by anybody greater than himself. So by uh, that it said that by two immutable reasons, he can't lie and his promises will never fail. And in those two things, they're irrevocable. God cannot change. We have to understand that. And in doing that and giving us that, we know, for example, that Romans 8.28 is never going to fail. All things work together for good to, the, the, to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. What happened to Tom? What happened to, to, uh, to Donna? What happened to me? What happened to you? Everything in your life will work out for your good if you know Christ. I mean, live for Christ, not know him. The, the billions of people know his name, but they don't live for him. And if you live for him, that's a special power that he gives you to know that, that whatever happened to Tom, it's going to work out for his good or to you or me. It's going to work out for our good. Why? Because he promised it. And it's irrevocable, no matter how bad I am, and he can't change it. That also means Hebrews 13, 5 is still in effect. It is written, he will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, I hear people say, Christians say all the time, you know, I'm kind of lonely. I live by myself. You're never by yourself if you're a believer, ever by yourself. And if you're not talking to God, who are you talking to? If there's nobody else in the house with you, you're talking to your flesh. It's either God or the flesh. It, we have to understand the absolutes of the Bible, and that's one of them. He never leaves you. Never. He's always with you. Not just in the dark nights. The other day, I, I was uh, playing golf, actually, with Tom. I felt the presence of Jesus Christ. I felt it. Do you feel that? Do you feel God's presence in your life? Or is he just a name? Do you feel it? You should, because he's there. Are you not the temple of God? Does he not dwell within you? Does he not influence you? You have to understand that as a Christian, you have to claim these things and not only claim them, you have to, you have to absorb them. We talked about praying without ceasing, but just have spiritual vision, anticipate God and everything. That's enjoying God. That's wonderful. And it means today, Isaiah 41.10 is still in effect. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What in the world does God have to do to let you know not to be anxious? Not to fear anything. You know what fear is for a Christian? It's unbelief. You don't believe the things that God has promised you. That's what it is. There's no reason to fear anything. Now, the metaphor used in our text to describe our hope in Christ is wonderful. It's an anchor. And I like that because I was in the Navy and I saw real big anchors. <laughs> now, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul. What it does, that part of the text, it, what it does is it paints a nautical picture of the Christian life. And that's what I want to talk about to you this morning. A nautical life in Christ. It gives the idea that our world is a restless sea, unstable, dangerous, and that never at rest. Is that not true? That's our world today. And we are the ships. We are the actual ships that are sailing on that sea. It's called the sea of life. And that's what we're sailing on. And everyday events in our lives are like waves that are driven by different winds that come into our life. There's winds of plenty. There's winds of joy, winds of grief, winds of adversity, suffering. Every single day, we spend our lives sailing on all the different winds that come into our life, don't we? Isn't that true? We also drift on different currents facing the storms of life being tossed to and fro many times. So it pleased God to give us a sovereign anchor of hope, an anchor that's sure, unmovable, and able to help us ride out life storms. One of the reasons why 
the United States of America is in such difficulty is they're not anchored into anything except evil, period. There is nothing this country is anchored to anymore that has any worth. It's all, it's all evil. When the country was formed, and I'm not going to get into this too deep, but just to give you a little highlight, when this country was formed, it was formed by men who loved God. It was, it was saved by people who believed that God was an important part of every soul's life. And he is. That's why we have in God we trust mottos on our money. We have it on our, on our buildings. And in doing that, for years, for centuries, it was fine. Until it wasn't. And today, and we were anchored in God. We were anchored in, in God we trust. I remember going to court Way back in the day, it wasn't for a bad thing, but I had to testify. And they pulled the Bible out and they said, put your hand on it. And do you swear to God to tell the truth? I wasn't saved, but I sure was going to answer, yeah. <laughs> I did. I said, sure, I'll do that. No problem at all. Right. They don't do that anymore. They took God out of the courtroom. And the motto, in God we trust, they're trying to scrape that off the buildings now. America is not anchored in anything except evil, period. You as a Christian, you have to live, and I said this before, you are living no different than the Egyptians did when they lived in Egypt. You are living in captivity because of your anchor being so much different than the anchor the world has. And everything. Interesting to note, an anchor that's sure and immovable, we could have many lessons on this whole thing, on this on that whole passage, those three passages. We could we could be here for, for Sundays, many, many Sundays. But this morning, I want to focus on just the truths that's suggested by the image of an anchor because it's so important. It's important because we have to know what we're anchored to in this world, especially as Christians, to make sure that we're anchored in the right spot and to the right thing. <clears throat> Let me begin by calling your attention to the design of an anchor. What's an anchor designed for? It's designed to hold a vessel in one place against the winds, or the currents that try to move it. That's what an anchor is. It just holds a vessel in one place, and the winds come around, the currents go, but it doesn't move. It waits until that all passes. And it holds it in place for only one reason. It keeps it from being shipwrecked. God's sovereign anchor works exactly the same way. The whole point of God's anchor anchoring you in his hope, his irrevocable, immutable hope, is to keep you and I from being shipwrecked. God gives us the truth in this book. We have the truth, we understand it, and it becomes an anchor in our minds against the winds of immorality, the winds of ecumenicalism, liberalism, false doctrine, all of the things that try to shipwreck our faith. It anchors us against those things. They come against us everywhere. You, you cannot go online. You cannot go on public television. You cannot go in a newspaper. You cannot go in a periodical. You can't go anywhere and not see evil. Very little good left in the world. Sure, there's some good people. But you're a different type of people. You're anchored in God himself. And that makes you different. And you have to live in a world that's anchored in something altogether different. And by the way, in our country, when I use the term country, I'm referring it to the people. Most of America wants nothing to do with God at all. That's why those of us who do can say we are really living in a state of captivity. 
Our sovereign anchor also holds us fast in our faith when the devil, the flesh, or the world tempts us. How many times have you done that? How many times have you been tempted by the world, tempted by the devil, tempted by the flesh to do something that you knew would offend God and you didn't do it? Because you're anchored in him. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Nothing can take you away from God. You can't even take yourself away from God. And when the currents of this world threaten to carry us in the wrong direction, can, an, can we can anchor our hope in 1 John 5, 4. For whoso, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Your faith in Christ, even if it's as small as a mustard seed, anchors you, anchors you against all the things that this world stands for. You have to stand fast. You know, did you know this? That in six inches of water that's traveling about 20 miles an hour, which isn't really fast, it'll take a man off his feet. The same thing happens here with evil. You are neck deep in evil in the United States today, and it's trying to bowl you over. It's trying to get you out of all the things that you think are right. You're, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your neighbors, maybe it's your friends, but it's certainly everybody that doesn't know Christ. They're trying to bowl you over. But you're anchored to Christ. You understand that? You are anchored to God. And because you're anchored, you have a you have a sovereign anchor, nothing will move it. Now, when that happens, does the boat get hit by debris that's flowing around? Absolutely. Does the boat get damaged a little bit? Absolutely. Which one of you here listening hasn't been damaged by the evil that's going around in this world right now? But yet you're still anchored. And you're anchored with a sovereign anchor. Because you know why that's important to, for me to tell you that? You know it, but you know why it's important? Because we know if we sail the waters of life, if we do that without our sovereign anchor, we will drift away from God's truth and drift into the Dead Sea. That's where we'll end up. We drift. How do we know that? Because we've all taken a, a little side turn once in a while. We pulled the anchor up a little bit and we drifted in the wrong direction. And it took God to come into your heart and say, throw that anchor out. You ain't going to the Dead Sea, pal. You belong to me. And God, listen, God will not allow not one of his blood-bought children to run aground in the sea of forgetfulness. He'll never let it happen. He'll bring you back. And you know why? <laughs> because God loves you so much. He gave everything he owns to possess you. He did. He didn't want Robotrons create people that love me. He could have done that. Then what did he have? He had nothing. So what he did was he created man, knew they were going to sin, regenerated everything except their flesh and now put them put life in front of them and providentially gave them a plan to live to live with so that they could see how much they love them that's all you're here for you're bearing fruit for god by submitting your life to him and in submitting your life to him you're showing yourself he knows how much you love him he's seen the the, the end from the beginning right wendy the end from the beginning he knows all that so it's not for him, it's for us. So he's going to keep you anchored in the right direction. You're going to be heading in the right direction. He paid too much for you. He gave you his word. He gave you his son. He gave you his kingdom. And he put his spirit inside of you. What was the cost of that? Somebody give me a number for the cross of Christ. And all the blood, I mean, all the lives that that blood saved. Give me a number. And how about, how about his word? What's it worth to know what's going on in this world through this book? How much is that worth? What's it worth? And what about being indwelt by God himself, an influence to you, 
and in your life to convict you, uh, to convict you of sin and to make sure that you're as close to the narrow to the middle of his will as you can possibly be. And when you do stray away, he doesn't let you go. He pulls you back. Why? Because you belong to him and the cost was so great. And you know what he gets out of uh, out of everything that he spent for, for us? The Bible says we're his inheritance. Huh. How about that? Did you ever think that, that somebody would love you enough to want you to be their inheritance? I tell you, that's a divine thought. No child of Adam would have ever come up with that. <laughs> that's how you know the Bible's inspired. Not to mention, besides everything I just said, not to mention his love for you. God has got an everlasting love for you. Jeremiah 31, uh, let's see, everlasting love. So he's not going to let you apostatize or become shipwrecked. That's what it is. It's John 10, 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. You ain't going nowhere. You're in Christ's hand and in the father's hand, and you're anchored there. You're going nowhere. How wonderful is that? How many people since you've been saved have you seen apostatize from their faith and never come back? A lot. Why? Because everybody wants God, but they want him on their own terms. God wants us to want him on his terms. So he gives us a new heart and helps us to do that. And then he anchors us in. It's, well, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful sale. It really is. So here we are today, this morning. We've been, we've been convoyed by grace. We've been provisioned by mercy. We've been steered by divine providence. And we've been propelled by supernatural power. That's what's in your boat. That's your vessel. And most importantly, God has added, uh, has added to that. He's equipped all of his children, every one of us, with a sovereign anchor to hold them fast while they weather the storms of life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but that which is common to man, and with the temptation will come a way of escape. There's never any, you're all here and in, in, in looking at the crowd that's here this morning at, and at prob the probable age, average age of us all, We've all had some traumatic experiences in our life. But here we are. Why? Because it was God's plan to be here. Because even before you were saved, he was watching over you. Hebrews 1.13 says, talking about angels. He said, are they not ministering spirits, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to the heirs of salvation? It's, he's talking about future things. So when you come into this world, if you're one of God's elect children, you, you're given angels to watch over you until you get saved. And then they're with you until you go home. And you're anchored. Everything is anchored in God. What a wonderful thought. You can never be lost. You might think you're lost sometimes, but you're never really lost. He's always there for you. You know that. And because you're attached to God's sovereignty, you will ride out the life's storms. And guess what? You're, you will finally enter the port of glory. That's where that vessel you're in right now is headed, to the port of glory. Now, I also want you to note about our text, our anchor is both sure and steadfast. This is very interesting. The word sure refers to our hope in Christ, to hope. Here's the definition. To hope means to have a desire and expectation of something. To have a desire and an expectation of something. So when I say I hope for something, I hope in Christ. When I say that, 
I hope in his love, Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I hope in that love. I have hope that he loves me. That is that I desire it and I expect it. I have hope in forgiveness, Ephesians 2, 1. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. I have hope that my sins have been forgiven and I'm made alive in Christ. I hope in that. I desire that and I expect that. Resurrection. I hope in my resurrection. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I have hope that he is the resurrection and the life and that I desire that and I expect that. Do you understand that? Hope, that's what hope is. I hear a lot of people talking about hope and that's, they use it in a general term, but that's really what hope means. Providence, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know my plans for you. They're for good, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that's it, the hope. I desire that, that plan, and I expect that plan to take place in my life. And what is what do I keep telling you guys about expectation? Anticipate God all the time. That's what your hope is about, anticipating him. And how about eternal life? Father, I desire they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. John 17, 24. I desire to be living with Jesus Christ, and I expect to be living with Jesus Christ. I expect it. My life is my backup. I know every day I get up how I feel about God, how I commune with God. I know my relationship with God, and I know that I want to grow in God. I know when I sin, I hate myself for doing it. So I can desire, that means I desire God and I expect God. That's my hope in God. And that should be your hope in God. Very simple stuff. Very simple stuff. And our hope in Christ is sure. We know it's sure because the same God that said, let there be light and there was light is the same one who said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. The same person who said both of those things. The one who declared, is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Isaiah 52. Same God said that. And he's the same God who promises, even to your old age, I am he. And even to your whore hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear and even I will carry and I will deliver you. Isaiah 46, 4. I have hope in all of that. I desire that and I fully expect that. That's why when I talked to Tom and he was telling me about what was going on, his attitude was, instead of, oh, man, why me? This good. Blah, blah, blah. He didn't do that. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I don't know how it's all going to shake out. We haven't got all the stuff in, but I'm doing good. That's a Christian attitude. Why? Because he understands that this didn't happen by luck, chance, or coincidence. It's part of God's plan for his life. What's he going to do with it? Who cares? We know he's doing it. That's all that I care about. He's doing it. And it will work out for his good. And he has the right attitude. So now people that see him, especially unsaved family members, when they see him, they're going to see his faith. And I want to tell you something. You can go out and you can beat somebody half to death with this book. And you won't get as far with, uh, with uh, teaching them about God than you will by living your faith and letting them see it. That's the best testimony. That's the best witness you can give anybody. And the more adversity you have, the better the testimony. You see, beloved, the God who formed the universe is the God of hope who forged the anchor that he put on each one of us. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's forged by the God of hope, which means regardless of the ferocity of life storms that threaten each and every one of us, our, our sovereign anchor of hope will never fail to hope. 
I remember once I was uh, in the Navy, we were in port and I was on an aircraft carrier and we have an anchor that's probably the size of this building or at least half of it, it was huge. And, um, and we anchored and a storm came up <laughs> and the ship moved, uh, the anchor didn't hold. So we had to start the engines up and we had to move out to a better place to lay anchor, okay? That never happens with God. Your anchor's never gonna fail. Your anchor's never gonna move. You're so you're you're sovereignly anchored. That means there's no there's no possible way it can ever break. None. And the other part of that text says uh, our anchor is steadfast. That refers to the anchorage that I just mentioned. What you're anchored to. What the anchor's holding on to. And we see our anchorage in the last section of our text. Look there where it's written. Entered into that which is within the veil. That tells you what you're anchored into. The term within the veil refers to God's special place in the temple in Jerusalem. It was called the Holy of Holies. One man went in there once a year to make atonement for the for the Israel. And he had a rope on his leg. Reason? Because if he went in there and he was unclean, God would kill him. And they had to pull the body out and let another guy go in. That's how holy God is. So this is saying, in essence, the idea of that verse of entered into that which is uh, within the veil. The idea here is that the elect's hope is directly anchored to God's throne room. Which means our hope is secure because we are anchored directly to God in Christ. Everybody getting that? So what forces in this world do you think, or the spiritual world do you think, has the power to ever separate us from God if we're anchored into the most holy of holies? What can separate us? Romans 8, 35, 38, and 39 gives us the answer. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall Listen to all of this stuff. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He didn't leave anything out in this world. Nothing can separate you from God. You're sovereignly anchored into the throne room of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's your sovereign anchor. And that means since you're anchored, your hope within the veil, Christ's promise to you is this. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. John 10, 29. You're never going to leave God once you belong to him. Who wants to? Who would want to after, after tasting the goodness? Now, if you're listening to this and you're lost, the promise gives God's promise to all who reject the biblical Christ. So if you're a tear, that is you're a Christian and you're not living, you're not living biblically. Anybody who rejects the biblical Christ, I'm telling you, or God's telling you, you're sailing through life without a sovereign anchor. And you're drifting towards the lake of fire. John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. You're sailing into the lake of fire because the wrath of God is on you. Because you rejected the blood that came, that came from Jesus Christ on that cross. Simple. Now all that being said. God in his mercy wants to give you a sovereign anchor to keep you from sailing, first of all, into the great gulf of hell. You're going to go into the gulf of hell before you go into the lake of fire. He doesn't want that. All you have to do is understand that you've sinned against him, realize that, repented of that, telling him you're sorry. And how hard is that? To just say, Jesus, I'm so sorry for offending you and meaning it in your heart, because you should mean it in your heart. I've offended, I've offended you. 
and I'm on my way to hell, and I don't want to go there. I want to be with you. I want to change my life. How many times have I heard and have you heard people say, you know, I wish I could change my life, but you have a chance. You call upon Christ. You repent of your sins first, and then you call upon Christ. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And he'll give you that sovereign anchor, and he'll anchor it in God for you, and you ain't going to the lake of fire. You're not. Now that you're anchored to God, you can sail up. Here it comes. Revelation 22, 1. You can sail up the river of water of life and enter the kingdom of heaven. And all you have to do is want to change your life. That's all you got to do is repent of your sins. Call out for that blood to clean you. Make you acceptable to God because your sins are paid for. Call me or see me and I'll show you in his word how he wants to attach a sovereign anchor to your life. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, God has given all of us a hope that's steadfast. Why? Because it's sovereignly anchored directly to God in Christ. It's unmovable, it's immutable, and it's irrevocable. And even though you'll, you'll fight strong winds, you'll fight strong currents in this life, you should be encouraged and assured that every day you're sailing toward the eternal port of paradise. That's where you're sailing to. So go home rejoicing because you know you, you are anchored in sovereignty and in you're anchored in God's love. Take that home and then sail straight all week long. Chart your course to be in the center of his will. And if you have any problems, you feel free to call me. Let's pray. Father, I, I just thank you for this message, uh, especially because it was nautical and there were so many wonderful things in Scripture that just relate to that. Would you help us to set sail this week, to set sail for the middle of your will as we, as we sail towards the port of of your kingdom the port of glory would you help us to do that we know we're anchored to you in christ would you help us to live that way would you help us lord to do these things and again if there's one whose heart is being stirred to come to christ so they can have a sovereign anchor would you have them call me or see me father thank you for your goodness and grace thank you for the sovereign anchor we have in christ and thank you for the great hope that is our desire and our expectation of all the promises you give us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.